Hey everybody, I'm Dennis Spillman and I'm with Jacob Blayton Burns and Zachary Burns. And these are the filmmakers behind the film Electric Nostalgia, which is now available everywhere you can get your movies pretty much. Uh, so this is for a new segment called Films Uncovered. You're watching Uncovering Oklahoma. And this segment really goes in depth with filmmakers. It's broken down into three sections. The first section is kind of very general questions about the film. Nothing spoilery. So if you haven't watched Electric Nostalgia yet, you, you stay tuned for the first part. Now the second part, if you haven't watched the film, we're probably going to ask you to tune out because that's where we're going to go into spoiler territory and really kind of dig deep into some of the themes and why you did certain things that you did. So this is a really great saying if you have seen the film, you might want to like know, want to know more. Like, why did you guys do that? Mm -hmm. And the third, uh, kind of giving back to the community, we kind of go real in depth for filmmakers. So this gets real more technical. You know, like, what did you learn as filmmakers? What advice do you have for other filmmakers? So, let's begin uh, with the easy question, hopefully. Tell everyone a little bit about yourself and your role with Electric Nostalgia. Uh, yeah, so Electric Nostalgia um, was a film that I wrote and directed um, in 2014. Uh, is when we shot it, and then it premiered in 2016. Um, and so, um, yeah, we've been... We've worked together, we're brothers, uh, and we've worked together on films and stuff like that since we were kids, and so each one just kept getting bigger and bigger, and eventually we got up to Nostalgia, which was our first uh, feature. This is uh, your first your first feature film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, but it was a lot of fun, too. Uh, how long did it take you guys to make the film? So we shot it in 2014. Mm -hmm. It was a, like a three-week shoot. In yeah, July. three weeks in July 2014. That's right. Um, before that, I had actually started writing the script probably like four years before that. Like, it was kind of a very slow, you know, I'd work work on it and then I'd go work on other things and I'd come back to it. It was a very slow pro process getting up to that point. Um, but yeah, so then we shot it in 2014 and then we premiered it in 2016 and we were working pretty much right up until we had to turn it into the festivals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even beyond that. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there's a lot of work, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the film. How would you describe the film? Again, no spoilers, but how do you describe the film to people? Mm -hmm. Totally. So, Electric Nostalgia is a sci-fi thriller. Um, it's about a young woman who experiences these dreams and visions and just kind of weird things keep happening to her, and she keeps seeing this man without a face. Um, and this all happens after she wakes up in a body that's not her own. Um, so it's very... Um, mysterious and mm -hmm. kind of thrilling and uh, it's kind of a... Uh, well, how would you describe this film? Um, well, one, it's black and white. Um, just heads up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely got aspects of a thriller. Um, and, but also it's definitely very psychological. We're very much focusing on what, what this lead uh, young woman is going through by being in a new body, um, and it's yeah, it's very complicated. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's definitely it's 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 kind of an interesting mix of being kind of a sci-fi thriller and having these kind of big, weird ideas. And there's mm -hmm. some VFX and stuff like that, but it's also at its core character drama about these people. So mm, for sure. So kind of leading yeah. into that, why should one see the movie? Um, I haven't seen it, so I don't know. <laughs> um, I can't vouch for it, but. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I well I think because of those reasons like I think it's mm -hmm. kind of, I think it's got a unique unique perspective um, hopefully it's got a female lead um, in the film uh, and it's yeah like it really kind of it takes these kind of themes and big sci-fi ideas and tries to use them in a way to kind of make this this story about um, these characters and what they're going through and kind of the, the, the kind of touches on like grief and stuff like that but it uses kind of sci-fi devices to do that so it kind of it kind of has that thrilling aspect um kind of wrapped around this character drama oh. yeah for sure yeah so uh kind of a little bit more about yourselves what got you interested in making movies so i've wanted to be i tell the story <laughs> <laughs> i've wanted to be a filmmaker since i was in third grade i told my um uh, school counselor there was one day she was going around to the class and she was asking everybody what, everybody, what they want to be. Um, and when it came to me, you know, most people were like, lawyer, astronaut, doctor, doctor exactly, yeah. all that stuff. And then I said, director. And she was like, a director of what? 
And I was like, movies? And she was like, oh, well, remember me when you're famous. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I remember, I remember her. Yeah, I should call her. Yeah. Give her a shout out? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and so like I've I've always just had an interest in movies. Our dad was a big movie buff, buff mm-hmm. so like yeah. at a really early age, we watched a lot of movies that people don't see until much later in life, um, um, or if at all. Um, like like watched, what? Like like kind of a lot of silent movies, like Buster yeah. Keaton. Um, who else? Like um, Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. Uh, the original Lon Chaney from. 1920 something yeah like all the universal monster yeah movies. all the yeah. universal monster movies um, um marx brothers um, yeah Alba and costello like we watched charlie chaplin yeah. um all kinds of stuff like that uh when we were very young and so we just kind of grew up jason and the argonauts um <laughs> <laughs> that's my jam right there, jason and the argonauts um so yeah we just kind of grew up loving movies and um uh, and of course, you know, we liked all the other stuff too. Like we were huge Power Rangers fans mm-hmm. and Ninja Turtles fans yeah. and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So we just kind of grew up with a very like Film diverse, or, yeah, like yeah. we just we just we we kind of liked all kinds of film yeah. entertainment. Pretty much any kind of movie we were into. Yeah, um, and so yeah, we just kind of from there, just kind of uh, eventually we got our hands on a VHS camera and started making movies. Yeah. What we, was your first movie about? Do you remember? I do remember. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah. Um, the first movie we made together was called Fifi. <laughs> um, and it is a essentially a giant monster movie, like a Godzilla movie. Um, but the monster's name is Fifi. Uh, and we used... We, um, we're big Godzilla fans, so we had a bunch of Godzilla toys. Hey, Godzilla. <laughs> Look at that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and so, yeah, we used them and with this VHS camera and just had them... This, Godzilla action figure fighting a bunch of uh, little green army men and all kinds of stuff. And it's 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 really bad. But, Cinematic gold. Uh, but that was our, our first venture into filmmaking. It's on. It is online. <laughs> YouTube. YouTube. If you search hard enough. Yeah. <laughs> you can find it. <laughs> um, so now Electric Nostalgia was made and shot here entirely in Oklahoma. So what was it like uh, just filming here in Oklahoma? Um, it was amazing. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, we, at the time, uh, we, we'd been doing, like, freelance work, and, and, and we'd done a lot of short films and stuff like that at the time, mm-hmm. but really we weren't, um, very well known at, yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, we kind of went into it not expecting a lot, but we were really surprised once we started, um, kind of pushing it and marketing it and stuff like that, just how quickly the community kind of came around it and supported it. Um, it just really, it really blew our minds. Um, yeah. and so, um, the, yeah, it was really amazing because then we were able to get into a lot of, like a lot of our locations and a lot of the crew and just like so many people were open and willing to, and then wanting to give and be a part of it, mm-hmm. um, and help us get it made. So, um, and there's just so much, in Oklahoma, like, locations and stuff oh, like yeah. that. Lots of cool places that are, you know, like, off the beaten path or whatever that it, that if you just look hard enough, you can find it. Um, and so we managed to get, I mean, really just, like, some of the locations we got really boosted the, like, production value of the movie oh, just because yeah. they looked interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so, there's uh, quite a few lo- unique locations. Now. Yeah, yeah. For sure. And so that was that was one of the fun, most and fun parts was the locations. That was, we were talking before, we did the interview, like, how many of some of those places don't exist anymore? Yeah, too. yeah unfortunately, yeah, it's crazy. yeah. Like, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, it's it's that's mostly attributed to just how long it took us to get the movie made. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's just it's the the city's changing really fast and oh, for uh, sure. mostly for the better, which is really cool. So, um, kind of a fun question: If you were brought back to life in another person's <laughs> body, who would you want that to be? Oh no. Well, obviously you haven't seen the movie, Dennis, because I don't know if you want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't really get to say. Another person's body. Um, uh, Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> he just seems like a really cool guy, and he's got a lot of things going for him. So. So that's yeah, a, I'm I'm gonna go with that. That's a good one. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. That's a good one. <laughs> so, uh, 
I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe if I die. If and then it's, <laughs> it's complicated. It's complicated. Uh, oh. <laughs> I will say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Or hmm. It's. It's like a joke question, you know. Doesn't have to be. See, that's the problem. I'm trying to think of like the funniest answer. Like, and, and I already said. Dwayne Johnson. Okay, you know what? The fir I don't know. I don't even know if I should say it. The first thing that came to my mind was Abraham Lincoln because he was just such a, such a great guy. Like, 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 <laughs> great. I can just take over where, where yeah. he left off. Like, great. Perfect. Perfect. Feel free to cut that. <laughs> All right. So before we kind of get into this, the second segment, we go into spoiler territory. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to say about the film, or anything else you guys want to say in general that you're working on? Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. we are currently working on our, our next film, another feature film. Um, it's a time travel horror movie called Shifter. Um, that I wrote and directed, um, or will direct, and um, we're very excited about it. It's going to be really cool. Yeah. So what's that about? So Shifter is about a young woman who experiences some painful and gruesome side effects from an experiment with time travel mm. gone wrong that causes her to shift through time at random. And so, um, it's an interesting yeah. interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be a lot I'm of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be a lot of fun. I can't it's wait to shoot it. Neat. All right, now we're going to get into spoilers, so if you don't want to be spoiled on the film, you haven't seen it yet, and you want to watch it, like, yeah. go, go, go. See you guys later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's my cue. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it. <laughs> uh, all right, so for the very first question is we're going to do like a too long didn't watch types question. So, uh, full spoilers, kind of essentially break down kind of what happens throughout the film, roughly. Okay. Um, not much, really. Yeah, um, it's pretty boring. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot happens in the movie. So, um... Whew, I've tried to, so... Whew, basically, uh, a, a gentleman named Leland Helm figures out a way that he can transfer a human consciousness uh, from their body to a artificial body that he has built. Um, and so... Um, once that person has deceased. Uh, and he, what happens at the beginning of the movie is he and his wife are in a car accident. Yep. And she dies. And he brings her back in a new body. It doesn't look like her anymore, but it's her in there. Yeah. Um, and it's so... It's pretty crazy. It's, yeah, and we're just... That's the first <clears throat> ten minutes of the movie. Um, Man, I'm hooked. <laughs> right? <laughs> we gotta see this movie. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um... So yeah, so then from there, the movie actually jumps ahead a few years uh, after he's kind of established his program a little bit better, mm -hmm. and he's got more. It's it's kind of an actual funded thing that he's working mm -hmm. on, um, and so we kind of follow a uh, young woman uh, named Rachel, who she actually begins working for Project Lazarus, which is the the organization that is doing all this uh, stuff and experimenting with it. They're still experimenting. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's all secret, it's confidential, the public at large doesn't know about it. Um, so she starts working for Project Lazarus, um, even she doesn't really know what yeah. they do there, it's very, very secretive, um, and uh, at the same time, she <laughs> and her, uh, her boyfriend, he proposes, mm -hmm. and so now she's going to get married, but we can see, you know, it's just this struggle between w her passion for her work and her love for her now fiance, like, they're, it's kind of a constant struggle, um, and so they start having some tension there, um, and eventually, uh, she dies. What? Uh, this and, is crazy. Right? Mm -hmm. And then, she's brought back in a new body. What? Mr. <laughs> Mr. Leland Helm brings her back in a new body. Get this, in the body that his wife was in. What? What happened to her? She died. Whoa! Under mysterious circumstances. She died again? She dies again. This movie is insane. 
we're 30 minutes into the movie. What? <laughs> no! There's so much more! There's so much more. Um, so, what happens from there? So, then she's brought back, so then it's a whole thing about, like, like, it, then it really focuses on like, okay, you're brought back in a new body. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Like how, what, what things do you go through as a person? How does that affect your mind? How does that affect you physically? Like, and then there's questions of, are you kind of the same person or yeah. are you something new? Um, and then she's like trying to, you know, cause it's all the secret and stuff. And you know, how do you explain that to your boyfriend? Right. What do, you, what do you do with the life that you were living? Yeah. Now exactly. that you are dead, and but also not dead. Yeah. It's like weird. to your friends and family, you're dead, but but you to you, you're still alive, but you're just in a new body, and so like yeah. how do you how do you cope with that? And so that's where it goes from there. And then of course there's other kind of stuff as far as who's. <laughs> um, well, we're in spoilers. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so there's this no face guy. Yeah. There's this guy with no face who starts showing up. Uh, she's Real questioning. Creepy. You know, she's she's trying to figure out what happened to um, Alexis, who was Leland's wife in the body before her. Um, and eventually, we find out that you know it's 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 hinted very loudly throughout the movie that Leland is obviously uh, behind a lot of this. And it, but the question of who the faceless man is, mm -hmm. um, and it turns out it's not. A weird glitch in her memory it's just it was literally a dude without a face yeah um it was uh the other the driver of the other car um in the, in the car accident at the beginning of the movie <laughs> guys it's, it's a whole it's, thing yeah, it's yeah. a whole thing it's, it's a whole <laughs> complicated thing <laughs> um you should just watch it technically i guess if you're here you've watched you it, already, watched it. But we're explaining it poorly. So just watch <laughs> it again, come back, and you'll, you'll be caught up. Well, let's kind of go into yeah. the cast a little bit now. Yeah, let's absolutely. talk a little bit about the cast. What was the casting process like? And mm -hmm. how'd you find the perfect fit for each character and person? Totally. So, casting, we did that in uh, 2014, like March yeah. or something like that of 2014, maybe May. Um, uh, um, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. Before we shot the movie. Yeah, like, <laughs> before we cast it. Before we shot it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Such a radical yeah. idea. Not making that mistake again. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we held auditions. Um, mm -hmm. And that was kind of the beginning of kind of the community support and stuff like that. That's yeah. how we kind of announced the movie was we just kind of started putting out this casting call. And it, it spread very quickly. Mm. Um, um uh, amongst the kind of film community here and even yeah. beyond. And so that was kind of how people started getting the word about the movie. And so we were really surprised. We saw uh, just over like 100 people mm -hmm. um, in person. And then we got a bunch of video auditions and stuff like that outside of that. Yeah. Um, which really just, I mean, because, just, yeah, like I said, like no one knew who we were. So we, yeah, it was, was kind of crazy how quickly it spread. So, um, yeah, from there, like uh, all the actors, I think, were from either the Oklahoma City area, there was a few from Tulsa, yeah. but all of them were from Oklahoma originally. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, some of them we've worked with before, some of them, uh, Lauren Anala, who was the lead, mm -hmm. she played Rachel, um, we had never met or heard of her until she walked in for an audition. Yeah. Um, and she just blew us away immediately. Immediately, we were like, this girl is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> um, and so, um, and then Stephen Goodman, we'd worked with a few times, uh, but it'd been years we really yeah he, he'd moved to LA for a little bit and then he'd come back right before I remember that. he was pretty interested because he wasn't playing a cop yeah <laughs> totally yeah he was he was excited it's a little different role for him if, if, yeah. if you've, you've seen the movie he's a he's kind of a he's a big buff guy big buff guy yeah and so like he kind of gets cast a lot of times as like you know frat boy um, or like just kind of douchebag characters right. or um, or cops and stuff like that and so this was a very different Mm -hmm. uh, role for him um, and so he was super excited uh, to kind of jump into that and um, we were excited that we found somebody for the role uh, yeah, yeah. like it's kind it of it's kind of a difficult role and mm -hmm. it involves we weren't sure if we were going to need to like cause it, there's kind of a time jump for like a younger version of him mm -hmm. so we were like oh do we need to hire a younger actor and an older yeah. actor and like how is this going to work but um, he worked out because he was kind of in the middle of the two ages, so we were able to just kind of yeah. make him look a like, little younger on one side, and then on the other side make him look a little older. Um, and then, um, but yeah, he was great. Um, He's he phenomenal. Did great. Yeah. Um, 
right away. And then, yeah, all the others, like Bonzi, I'd seen him in a few things, uh, Josh Bonzi, um, and he's, he's just, yeah, just phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Um, Paige Tudyk, I think, I think we maybe knew of each other, but really didn't. Yeah, didn't really work with her. But yeah, I didn't really know her, um, but yeah, same thing, she just came in. And Alan, we'd worked with many times before, Alan Davidson, um, he um, was in a short film we did right before called Broken Boy. Yeah. Um, and he's just um, really, really great. Mm -hmm. Kind of natural, um, really great at taking a script and the dialogue and throwing it away and making it better. Like, yeah. like really, <laughs> he's, he's one of my favorite actors to work with. Yeah. Just a cool dude. Yeah. Always yeah. helpful to have for that talent. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we usually we try to start there. We start with talent. <laughs> yeah. and then, start with uh, talent. <laughs> but um, yeah. That I mean that I mean I think for for me like, the cast. Um, really pushed me to want to make a better movie because like mm -hmm. on set I was like, oh crap the movie has to like live up to the performances yeah. I'm gonna feel really bad if they do these amazing performances and then the movie like sucks so. right. So it was, it was, and that's perfect. That's what you need. You need people on set who are going to push you, uh, to do, to do better. Um, so hope, I hope, I hope I was pushing them to do better. And I know for, they absolutely were pushing us to do better. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, let's kind of talk more about the very first things that people notice about the film. Yeah. It's black and white. Why is that? Did you forget to put the color back in? Oh or? no. Oh, okay. I know I forgot <laughs> something. <laughs> um, yeah, it is in black and white. Um, and so there's a few reasons why we did that. The, the number one reason, um, is also the most unsatisfying reason for people here. Uh, but it's just, it just felt right. Um, every time I, when I was writing the script and I would start to kind of visualize the movie, um, it was, it was always just black and white. Um, and I think why that is to kind of delve into that a little bit more, um, I wanted the film to have a very kind of otherworldly feel to it, um, like kind of almost a fantastical feel, um, and I didn't want it to feel like the the real world necessarily. I wanted mm -hmm. it to kind of feel like this is a thing that's happening in a different space, a little um, almost like dreamlike, or just kind of it just kind of yeah. added an atmosphere, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it really. Kind of, I'm I'm honestly not sure the movie would work if it was in color. Like it just doesn't. It'd be a completely different movie. Yeah, it'd just be a yeah. totally different movie. Um, and it, it kind of strips away some things and kind of gets you to focus more on um, what's happening. Or like I don't know. Like it just yeah. kind of it just it, it it brings a new perspective to everything. Um, mm -hmm. It was kind of interesting because like when we filmed it, we filmed it digitally, so it's in color. Um, what we can get into that in the next section. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, a whole, that's a whole interesting. That's process. a whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So it but it was interesting. Once we we filmed it in color, all my monitors on set were in black and white, so I could see mm -hmm. uh, watch it that way. But when we were looking at the dailies, they're all in color. And um, when we'd like, kind of do like a quick initial thing of putting it in black and white, it totally changed the mood and everything yeah. about what was happening on screen it really it, it, it was fascinating um, yeah so yeah that's that's the main reason why we kind of want to add kind of this different kind of atmospheric almost dreamlike quality to it to kind of make separate it from the real world a little mm -hmm. bit for sure all right well i'm going to actually read uh how you start the film with a quote actually from frankenstein oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. the labor is a man genius however and, ah, I'm going to butcher this, but <laughs> uh, basically, the errors directed sincerely ever fail and ultimately turning to the solid advantage of mankind. Is this something you personally agree with? <laughs> uh, oh. oh, So, that quote essentially is a fancy way of saying the ends justify as the means. Right. Um, and, and no. <laughs> I do not, I do <laughs> not personally <laughs> just blanket do agree with agree. that statement. Um, it's it's one of those things that throughout human history we've had to deal with um, mm -hmm. is the fact that some of our most amazing technological advantages through technology or medicine or whatever kind of stuff was found through 
bad people doing bad things to other people. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a sticky point. Like it's, yeah. it's not a fun thing to think about, but it's something that's true. Um, is that, that's, that's just something we have to deal with as humans. Um, and so, uh, no, I don't think that's, that's good. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think that, good thing, that should yeah. not be why you set out to do something or, or, or whatever you should, you should always put human, uh, life and, um, and people above things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, but I, but it is a question that I think, you know, pops up throughout history. And so I think it is a fascinating thing to think about, um, and explore. And so, you know, like the, the film definitely takes a huge influence from things like Frankenstein, um, mm -hmm. uh, both the, the movie and the book. Um, and so that, that quote is from the book. Um, and, um, it's essentially, it's actually in the book to give you a little bit more context. Um, it's not Dr. Frankenstein saying that it's like his professor yeah, um, or something like it. It's someone mm -hmm. else saying it to him, but it's kind of an early, it's before he creates the monster and everything yeah. like that. Um, or the creature, I think is what they call yeah, it. Creature, the creature. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, it just really stuck out to me. I wanted to find a quote that kind of, to put at the front of the movie that put us into Leland's headspace a little bit mm -hmm. and why he does things and, and why, he, you know, and essentially uh, in the movie, there's a phrase that's used over and over again, the process, it's all a part mm -hmm. of the process. Yeah. In Leland's brain, I think that's, that's basically it's a simplified version yeah. of, of saying that quote. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's the main reason I wanted to kind of put us, just put it right up front. Yeah. It, especially because the very first scene is Leland working on this experiment. Um, and so I just kind of doing something very unethical yeah. exactly to yeah. advance that science exactly yeah. kind of leading into that yeah the, the beginning it seems yeah he is working on is very unethical it, and it looks like that and it's shot like that however in the very next scene you pretty much kind of like make it seem like oh this is very ethical this is very <laughs> normal um, and it was just kind of like like I've seen the film before and it's just like wait a second <laughs> It's like this seems like she's because his wife's all like super happy about it. Like, How's right? it going, dear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, to explain that, like the the thought and the story behind all of that process. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, like I said, like I think the movie is kind of trying to show that that conflict mm -hmm. between, uh, you know, the ends justify the means and just being a decent human being, mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and also just you know like taking it from the perspective of how the characters feel about it in that moment. Yeah. Like, for them, this, you know, he's been working on this for years and stuff like that, so it's a totally normal thing for him to stay all night in his lab, his storage unit lab, <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and with cadavers and do this stuff. And so, um, so yeah, like, I, again, like, I think it just goes back to that, that contrast of showing that, that conflict between these ideas. Mm -hmm. So what were some... Uh particular scenes that you really enjoy in the film? Um, to shoot, I love the uh, the scene where she crawls out of the tub with yeah. the gel. Um, that one was... Um, Which one? <laughs> There's two Good point, good yeah. point. Uh, the big one. Uh, the one in the middle of the movie when mm -hmm. Rachel crawls out. Um, yeah. um, that one was... It was super hot. Um, getting that gel to work just right. It was like whole yeah. process and like, we'll thing. get into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. We'll talk, we'll exactly talk about yeah. that later. Um, but, um, it was one of those scenes where it was just like, man, if this scene doesn't work, the movie doesn't work. Like, yeah. wait, the, mm -hmm. this, this is like the most important scene in this movie. Um, because it totally sets up everything. Um, and so we, we did a lot of testing and experimenting at a time, but you know, it's, always on set is a different experience yeah. and so um talked a lot with lauren about it ahead of time and um she totally agreed like she totally understood and yeah just watching her crawl out we had the camera set up and uh just going through that whole thing and we we knew immediately that we had it like yeah. um it was just very very exciting um what about you oh man um what are the scenes in the movie? Um, 
So he starts in the storage unit. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to list all the seats real quick. <laughs> yeah, just, list all the seats. <laughs> just list everything. Um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, just being any scene that was in the either lab, either the, the prologue one or, or the second okay. lab, like it, either one of those scenes was just really fun to be in because it really felt like this completely different world that you were in that you I just walk into and be like, whoa, this is a crazy laboratory. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so pretty much anything that we shot in there was super fun. Um, also really hot. Um, it was very hot. Um, but yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. one. Kind of asking about the end of the film now, um, why did you let Leon get away with it? <laughs> did uh, but did he? <laughs> did he did get he? away with it? So, um... Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I almost would argue that I don't think he does... He gets away with it in... The in a legal sense. In a legal sense. Like, the law doesn't come to get him. Yeah. Um, but I think but he... In his own mind, in his own yeah. brain, it's definitely he didn't get away with it. It's going eat to eat away at him, I think. And so, like, I think one of the kind of major themes of the movie is um, grief and how people deal with it. And um, so you can kind of see how... The difference between Leland and Timothy handle things. So Timothy is able to move on at the end. He's able to start putting the photos away and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and start a new phase of his life. Whereas Leland basically keeps living the exact same mm -hmm. scenario over and over again, yeah. and it's by his own doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think he, yeah, like you said, like the police don't come and get him and take him away. Um, but as we as we see at the end of the movie, the new. Uh, woman in that body what name was it emily or something like that um yeah it's emily right emily um, it was i, I watched it every <laughs> <day>. <laughs> it's fine i've seen it yeah <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> uh anyways there's a new woman in that body and she's saying the exact same things that the mm. others have said and so yeah. um i think he's doomed to repeat that because he's not willing to confront what he's done he's he's, he's doomed to be haunted by what he's done so, Electric Nostalgia 2, any plans on that? <laughs> Here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and lay out the story. So, right. <laughs> um, I, you, you know, I'll never say never, but probably not. Uh, probably not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> no, no, I feel, like, feel like that story is it's done. pretty complete. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, every once in a while we speculate on what something like that would be, but... It would have to be a really, really good story and interesting perspective, yeah. especially because I feel like the Leland story is done. So yeah, it would, I think it would so. maybe need to follow someone else or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, now we're going to get into the filmmaker discussion portion of the film. So if you're not oh. a filmmaker, you may want to tune out for yeah. this I'll leave part. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are, you've probably probably been waiting for this the whole time, and maybe you might skip to this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's. All right, we're going to start off but kind of again at the beginning, kind of going back to the black and white part. But what were some of the technical challenges you encountered when trying to make it uh, black and white? How it was different from you know, shooting a film in color? Totally. So one of the assumptions that a lot of people have made when they've asked about the black and white <laughs> and stuff like that is they assume it was easier. Um, and in some ways, <laughs> like there's some aspects that, yes, it technically was easier. But the thing to think about is... Um, like when you're color correcting and stuff like that, mm -hmm. we, we only took out one element of that. Yeah. Like all the other stuff is still there, contrast and all mm -hmm. that other junk. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so- You still gotta balance all of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like it's still, and we still had to go through every single shot, and, or Zachary specifically had to go through every single <laughs> shot. That's me guys. Frame by frame sometimes and, and do things. And that's, that's, awesome. just, that's just how it is. Um, and then the other thing on set was it, we had to like rethink and yeah, a lot of things. Um, so you're you're thinking more uh, in terms of tone mm -hmm. versus um, color. Like you know, like we have separation of color. You know, like Zachary stands out from this table and this wall because he's got this bright blue shirt. Yeah. Um, so that can help. But if we if you put this in black and white, you can look. I wouldn't be surprised if. This shirt and the wall are probably pretty close to the same tone. Mm -hmm. So it would look like white. all one color. So we had to test everything, every th piece of wardrobe that they wore in black and white. Uh, uh, because there were times like they'd be wearing 
wildly different colors, but then when you put it in black and white, it would all look the same, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and they would blend in with the wall or something like yeah. that. And so we had to really think about, like, okay, we had to look at that, and then, so <laughs> what's great is when we were doing some of the wardrobe fittings, uh, one time Paige Turek was there, and she had on, like, I don't even know what colors it was. Like all ridiculous was, colors. Yeah. Like her pants were one color, her shirt was different colors. She had a jacket that was something totally different. Like they all clashed, and and in person she was just like, I would never wear this in public. <laughs> like, she was just like, I wouldn't know why is it, why am I wearing this right yeah. now? But then when we looked at it in black and white, it looked great. It looked great. Yeah. Um, and so it was just like we just had to do a lot of testing, and so we had to do that with some of the sets and stuff like that. We had to really think mm -hmm. about like. The, the separation has to come from uh, tone. Um, yeah. yeah, especially like, I mean, your outfit would probably all look about the same. Yeah, probably all be about the same level of gray. Um, and so, yeah, it was just kind of a different way of thinking and we had to really keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, and then on set, my monitor um, was, we had it set to, uh, we desaturated it, so it, was, it looked mm -hmm. black and white. It was a very mm -hmm. rough idea of what it would look like eventually. Yeah. Um, but that at least like kind of helped us on set so we could see if the, any of these issues yeah. came up, pop then up right there. then and there. Yeah. But, exactly. but that being said, if you were to watch Electric Nostalgia in color as we shot it, it would look terrible. It would look horrible. Like all, everybody's <laughs> colors would be ridiculous and zany. <laughs> like Stephen Goodman Stephen Goodman, like the shirts he would wear, all, most of them were really, really oh, yeah. brightly saturated shirts like yeah. he had this really bright green one that he wore one day and this it's other like, it's like yoshi super, green yeah like, yoshi yeah. green this other one was like super deep red like solo cup red yeah um and so if you just watch the movie in color you're like this leland guy is very eccentric <laughs> like, very like, odd fashion very, very yeah, yeah like um and yeah light temperatures would be all over the place yeah um so yeah like in color as we shot it it would actually look very stupid. <laughs> um, so there is only a black and white version. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's the only one that looks but good. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, like it just. We had to. I think early on, I'd kind of thought like, well, we'll, we'll shoot it in a way that it could work in color or in black and white. Mm -hmm. And very early on, when we were doing testing and stuff like that, we're like, oh no, we have to make a choice. Yeah. Like either either it's color or it's black and white, and we went with black and white because it felt right. Yeah. So, um, in terms of, like, I don't know if you did or not, but any cool gadgets or anything that you, props or sets or anything that you made, you guys made, or was made for the film that was, like, really cool that you guys are really proud of? So, we had a few cool things mm -hmm. made. Um, as far as props, I think what's my Uh... Well, I just the that EMP gun. Oh yeah, that's we right. had yeah. made uh, our, a friend of ours, uh, Corey Malcolm, made that for us, and it's an old um, uh, <laughs> remote control car remote where oh, it had okay. like yeah, the wheel nice on it, and, yeah. And so he, we just gave it to him. We're like, make this into an EMP device. <laughs> um, he was like, okay, um, and then he brought back what it was in the movie, and we're like, yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, and that's that really cool. I think it's still around somewhere. But it still works, and it's awesome. And anytime I see it, I pick it up, and I, I shoot people with it. <laughs> <laughs> Just to check and make sure if they're robots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, and just, like, the lab that you and you and uh, Casey Crowdis put together, yeah. like, all that stuff. Which um, one? Which lab? Both of them. Both yeah, they, they did Both all. labs, yeah. They, um, you can talk about it more, but they um, found most of that stuff to, like, estate sales and um other kinds of surplus surplus options. yeah because um, you had a lot of vintage equipment that's yeah. not hard or not easy to come by essentially if you go to a surplus auction they sure are <laughs> um, which is great because you you just show up to those things and they're they're so crazy because i'd never been one been to one before until uh, me and casey kraus were gathering science for this movie hmm. um Gathering and science for the movie. Yeah, we, we just call it, kept ever, calling everything science. Yeah, we're like, we, we need, need more science need in more this. More science. Um, <laughs> One side, Billy, like, can we get some science over here? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we just show up to these auctions, and it's it's crazy because there's just, you know, uh, 20 or 30 people here at this um, 
Uh, it, depending on which one you go to, some of them were kind of in more junkyard type things, some of them were just in big warehouses. Um, but they'll just have these pallets cram packed full of all kinds of different stuff, just either like old computers or old cables of some kind and um, all kinds of stuff. And so you'd just walk around and you'd bid on uh, the pallet as a whole. They wouldn't sell, you know, mm -hmm. bigger things they would sell, they'd auction off individually, but they'd just sell off these whole pallets. Um, and so that's where we got pretty much all of our science uh, for both of the labs. Um, we got some pretty cool things. Um, and we kept kept some of them just because they're so cool. Yeah, oh yeah, they're awesome. Um, yeah, all the monitors worked. If you see a monitor on screen in the movie, like we, it really works. There's a couple yeah. of times that we had to add it in post, but like yeah. for the most part, if it's playing on the screen in the movie, it was probably playing there. We figured out a way yeah, to yeah. get it there. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it was it was super cool. We got there's a server tower. Yeah. In the movie, we got that at a surplus auction for 50 bucks. It's amazing. Um, it was great because you could get so much stuff for really cheap. Yeah. Um, as long as, you know, no one else was really yeah, wanted yeah. it. And then you would bid higher. But And then the, uh, the, the tub that she crawls out of <laughs> is a, uh, a koi pond. It's a koi pond, mm. yeah. And we just had uh, Corey Malcolm. He did a lot of other props. He kind of... Uh, uh, he added, like, kind of a... A, a shell around it and yeah. stuff like that. He did some stuff to it, but essentially yeah. painted it. Yeah, that was um, our aunt's koi pond that she yeah. had in her backyard for years. Yeah. <laughs> and she got rid of it. And we're like, we'll take it. We'll take it. And then, yeah, just showed up to Corey Malcolm's door and was like, can you turn this into something that's not a koi pond? <laughs> um, he was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, kind of going on to that emerging scenes, or scenes, I should say, uh, how did you film that? Yeah, so those were a lot of fun um, and took a lot of prep. A, a process, yeah. But yeah, it was all part of the process. It was all yeah. part of the process, yeah. Huh? How many tries <laughs> no, to get that goo and everything right? Oh, uh, really not too many. We did some test shoots beforehand. Yeah. Uh, we did some research and then we had done some test shoots. Um, and um, actually, our mom was in charge of all the, making all the gel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mom. Thanks, mom. Uh, she, uh, uh, but it's just, it's Knox gelatin, which you can get at the grocery store. Yeah, anyway. Um, we, we just bought a bunch of it, uh, online. Um, and, um, she would spend, how long did it take? It took a long time. Um. Six hours or something? Yeah, like, like six hours to make a batch. Yeah. Which, you know, we needed a lot, so. Yeah. So I think we had enough for, like, two full takes yeah. And then we could like we could we could piece the egg, egg, yeah, excess together yeah. to make a, a third take third. if we did a certain section. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I take you had that that was the kind of the top layer essentially and she, the actress was kind of underneath that mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the way it was set up, so they had the koi pond or the tub or whatever. Um, and what we did Lauren was Lauren gets in. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, she gets in first. <laughs> first thing, first thing she gets in crams herself in because you know you can't sit you can't just sit yeah, in one of those cool. you gotta yeah. crumple yourself up She's such a trooper yeah yeah thanks lauren yeah um and then over that we would pull very tightly just a, a kind of a thick plastic sheet um and pull that really nice and tight get it nice and flat uh on the top and then we would set the the gelatin sheets on top of that um, yeah, so the gelatin sheets were like an inch, inch thick. and a half yeah. thick or so. Yeah. Um, and then we'd set up all the cameras uh, and and then say, okay, Lauren, get break yourself out of there. <laughs> yeah. We had to like cut a hole. A starting hole, So you hole, can kind of yeah. see, and she starts with just like a couple fingers sticking out through it. Um, yeah. And then, but yeah, then from there she just like, just like, just get, get out just somehow. Go. Yeah, <laughs> just, just go for it. it. Um, so yeah, that was a lot of fun. And then she, um, she was really, because we had done the test shoot with her mm -hmm. and, um, uh, so she watched some of the playback on those, um, and kind of felt like she knew what she needed to do to really sell a performance better. Yeah. And she really took it super seriously. She really oh, kind yeah. of amplified that scene quite a bit, um, just through her performance. And she was at one point. You know, she's in this this tub thing, and it's like hot. This room is so hot, and I'm sure it was really, really hotter hot. in there. Um, and during after one of the takes, she was like sitting there in the tub. She's like, 
can I get some water? And we're like, oh, Absolutely. yeah, of course. Yeah, and we, like, go get some water, and we hand it to her, and we're like, you need a straw or anything? She's like, no. And then she just, like, pours it she all over it herself. Because yeah. she didn't need it. She didn't want it because she was thirsty. She wanted it because she wanted it to look grosser. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. She wanted to look more uncomfortable and stuff like that. And so... And um, she would take handfuls of some of the right. broken up oh, like gel from that. previous takes. She would just grab it and then just smush it all over her yeah. hair and her face. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's she's great and intense and yeah. very dedicated. Uh, thanks, Georgie. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, dude. Oh, sorry, but thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, talk about one of the other kind of special effects you have more throughout the film, uh, the electric nostalgia moments. So how did you film those, yeah. and was there one of those that was more difficult to create than any of the other? That... So the way we did um, all that stuff is, it kind of depended from scene to scene, but essentially, so if anything that dealt with the faceless man, mm-hmm. um, who uh, on set we, were, we called him Lazarus, um, yeah. in the script he's referred to as Lazarus, but he's, we never call him that in the movie. Um, yeah. But anyway, so anything that dealt with Lazarus, um, our makeup artist, uh, Megan, uh, was so great. Um, when, when I told her I needed, we needed a person with no face, she did, she didn't blink. She was like, okay, I've got like three ideas. How <laughs> I, that. I was like, great. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> great. Um, uh, so she found a really simple way, um, to do it. Um, so on set, he didn't have a face. He was walking around with no face, mm-hmm. um, which that was Clint Kubot, um, and he's another absolute trooper. Like, he's oh, yeah. so hot. He wore that. We put him the in a jack- ski coat. Ski jacket. He's wearing a beanie. Yeah, like... So he was very comfortable throughout the entire process. And never complained once. Yeah. Like, it was amazing. Um, so, um, uh, but yeah, so he would have no face on set. Um, and then a lot of that other stuff is just some camera trickery and stuff like that if we needed... Um, sometimes there's moments where characters are like switching between two different characters. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really as simple as we put the camera on a tripod, leave it there, press record yeah. with one actor, make, yeah, that actor leaves, switch them out for the new actor and then press record mm-hmm. again. And then when you edit it, you're just, you just cut back and forth very quickly. Yeah. Um, and so stuff like that, um, I'm trying to think. And then in post, um, our VFX artist, um, Brady Foster, would enhance like the faceless man and stuff like that, the glitchiness and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, he would enhance all that, which um, he did. Awesome job. Yeah, great job. Awesome job with that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any like particular moment that was really hard for that. It, it was mainly just we just did a lot of planning beforehand. So yeah. In, in theory, we kind of knew what was happening. Um, I don't. I don't typically storyboard everything in a movie, but scenes like that are ones that I definitely. Yeah. Um, take a little bit more care in, in framing and just making sure, especially you know, we've got people in, in makeup and, and in the ski jacket and stuff like that. So you want to make sure you're as prepared as possible so you can get yep. them out of there as possible. Um, and then, um, yeah. 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 So kind of overall, what was probably, would you say, is probably like the most difficult thing about the film that was challenging as, for film, as filmmakers? Yeah. Um, lack of time. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, the biggest thing. Like, um, yeah, we just, we just, a lot of times it felt pretty rushed as far as mm-hmm. making sure, like, st- you have all these plans and then you get there and you're like, uh, we actually only have this amount of time to do this, so we need to, like, f- we just need to shoot it in a way that we capture the information and move on. Um, and so, um, that can be frustrating, I think, we, I think it, didn't hurt the movie too much, but you know, just on set, it, that's a yeah. definitely a frustrating thing. Um, and then um, there's a few situations where um, we had to, so the, the Paramount building where we shot all the stuff in the lab, it, pretty much anything Project Lazarus related, we shot mm-hmm. at the Paramount building, um, which was amazing. Yeah. Uh, but they were actually going through, we caught them right Right as they're, mm-hmm. not right before doing renovations, right as they were starting renovations. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so um, there's some scenes, like the scenes in the control room with uh, uh, Elliot, where they're like watching the screens of the lab. Like literally the day after we shot those, they walked into that room with hammers and sledgehammers and everything. And, and just tore knocked, those walls out. The, like... So that, that room was gone before we were done uh, yeah. filming it. Uh, there's a few other situations like that where they literally started working on it. 
And so there's actually, um, we actually had to get out of that space a little bit sooner because they were going to start a little bit sooner than we thought. So we had to kind of yeah. like rework like, oh, okay, actually this scene's going to take place in the lab now and stuff yeah. like that. So we had to kind of quickly <laughs> rewrite. But, but that stuff actually transferred pretty quickly. But it was just kind yeah. of interesting obstacles that you, you can't plan for that. They just come up. Um, and it was just so hot. That was the other yeah, thing. Yeah, it was just really, it was really so hot. hot. Yeah. Um, there is also the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one day we were shooting. <laughs> We've told the story a lot, so you may have heard this. But um, so we were shooting. I do <laughs> yeah, we were shooting in the lab one day. Um, so stupid. Uh, and uh, we just. We were doing a big scene, a big heavy scene. It was the last scene of the movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or it's the uh, um, the, the the like the big reveal of. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, the big climax. Yeah, yeah, the climax of the movie, not quite the last scene, but um. So yeah, we were in the middle of shooting that in the lab, and then uh, we just kept hearing. We just heard some talking like that and so we were like what is that we'd like walk around uh outside the lab walk around and be like there's no one out here talking like yeah there's just got the windows lot, like nothing's going on um so we keep shooting and and then we just hear some more <laughs> that sound kind of like charlie brown <laughs> or whatever yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, um and uh and yeah, so so then we were finally we were like, well that's weird, I don't know, but we just gotta keep going. Um and then all of a sudden we hear And we all just stop and look at each other. And not long after that, uh Vinny, our other producer, walks into the lab and was like, I got a great joke for you guys. <laughs> Because uh, this is how we would tell each other bad news. <laughs> you just walk in and be like, I got a joke for you. Um, down the street at the Myriad Gardens, they are uh, playing Ghostbusters on the lawn. Yeah, uh, outdoor screening of <laughs> Ghostbusters. Which is great. Which is awesome. Like, that sounds like something I'd want to go to. But right in this moment, I was like, no, man, I got a movie to make. Like, um, <laughs> So Ghostbusters uh, got in the way of making yeah. this movie, um, <laughs> but uh, but like it's one of those moments, and it's really just a testament to like the cast and crew on that movie. Like, yeah. we should have gotten angry. We should we could have gotten stressed and started yelling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But we all just laughed. And, yeah, and we've laughed about it every every day since. <laughs> um, uh, That's good. And so like we. And, you know, in some ways, like, that day was, like, a big day. We'd actually mm -hmm. shot the tub scene when she crawled out of the tub that yeah. morning. And then we're doing this scene. So, like, I know both uh, Lauren especially was exhausted mm -hmm. already. And I was yeah. mentally exhausted just because it's two very important scenes. And then Stephen was exhausted just because it's freaking hot out there. Yeah. Um, so, like, in some ways, we're, like, ultimately grateful it happened because then we were able to reschedule and shoot it on a day where we were more rested and ready to go. But, yeah, uh, but yeah like, it was just kind of a, it was just, it's, that is one of my favorite times from the set because, like, yeah. we just all, everybody just, like, shrugged and was like, well, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah. This is great. Uh, <laughs> let's check something else, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Something. So what were some of the things you kind of learned as filmmakers that you're going to be taking on with you to your, like, your next project? It's like, well, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> uh, my lesson there. Hmm. <laughs> let's see. Hmm. Any lessons? Did we learn anything? No, I learned nothing <laughs> from this. We're making so. another movie, so obviously we didn't learn anything. <laughs> we didn't learn not to make movies. Um, oh, man, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I think we, we learned that uh, me, Zachary, and Vinny spread ourselves way too thin. Yeah. Um, and we need to bring on more help. <laughs> more people. More help for those things. Um, uh, so Vinny was our first AD. Um, he was a producer, he was also a first AD, and he was also, like, our key PA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he was he, and our craft service guy. Yeah. Um, so, like, he... Thanks, Benny. Not thank, only... Thanks, thank Benny. you. Um, not only was he, like, having to try to schedule the movie and, like, contact actors and make sure they're on set on time and keep yeah. the mo movie going, he also had to... <laughs> 
go buy snacks and water for everybody and then yeah. get to set early and set it up. Um, so it was just it was just very taxing on all of us because we all were taking on multiple too many roles. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, just the importance of that and just you know we 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 got lucky um, with that. Um, and again, like our crew was just so so helpful in kind of picking up some slack and just being very understanding um, and committed to the movie. For sure. Um, and then, um, yeah, there's probably a bunch of, like, boring little things we learned, but I'm trying to think of anything yeah. interesting. Um, things, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think just, like, as a filmmaker, I think I grew yeah. a lot. Like, we learned a lot about... Um, going through that whole process of shooting it, you know, the, the, the first cut of the movie is like two and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. The final cut of the movie is 91 minutes, I think. 93 minutes. Yeah. Um, with credits and everything. And so it was a very, like, kind of eye-opening experience as far as, like, you know, on set, you think every single take needs to be perfect all the way mm -hmm. through. Yeah. Um, no. And it really doesn't, because ultimately in the movie, you're probably going to use just a section from different takes or whatever. And so, like, mm -hmm. if the beginning of this take is perfect, but the end wasn't that great, but then the next take, the beginning's not that great, but the end is great, if, just, if it's if a scene that you're cutting, if it's, yeah. if it's a one or that's one thing, but, like, yeah, yeah. if it's a scene that you're cutting in between things or something like that, then you can just do that. So right. I think, like, I mm -hmm. think we'll be a lot more efficient on future sets, and I think we'll be a lot more about getting exactly what we need um, and going along with that, like, um, like a big reason why the initial cut of Electric Nostalgia is like two and a half hours long is because that's just, that's everything that we shot is yeah. in there. And then just a lot of stuff gets cut. Either things get shorter or some scenes are just cut completely. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is because there's, in reading a script, there's a lot of things that you feel you need to say. There's things that you need to have there in the script. But then when you actually watch the movie uh, visually, like a lot of those things that you thought needed to be written down and explained out in that way don't need to be explained out so heavily visually. And people kind of catch on to those things. And so that's why there's a lot of stuff that, you know, just gets cut. Um, and so I think that's a big lesson. Totally. Uh, going forward is just that, you know, there's a lot... There's just, I mean, it's going to happen with any movie. There's a lot in the script that isn't going to need to be there Yeah. in the, the actual finished cut. And yeah. so it's just being able to hopefully try to recognize more of those before we go into production. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we don't have to shoot as much, that's ultimately going to get cut. Yeah, there's there's a ton that was cut. Um, the movie essentially got another two or three rewrites in, yeah. in post-production. There's scenes in the movie, uh, in the finished film, that happen in, like, the first half of the movie that like yeah. script wise actually happen in like the third act of the movie. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a matter of like, once you actually see it on screen, suddenly information is processed way different than it is on the page. Mm -hmm. And even like silly things like, so there's like this whole montage in the script and we shot it of the, of Paige Tudyk when she was playing the first iteration of Rachel. Um, we, had written this like whole montage that's like it was supposed to like kind of establish her yeah. her personality and like make her likable and stuff like that um but then Paige Tudyk is just so unnaturally likable yeah that you didn't need it it just felt redundant because like just immediately you get a sense like she did such a great mm -hmm. job with the character and she's just a great person in general that like is like Anybody who hangs out with Paige Tudyk for two seconds knows that she's a delightful, awesome person, right. and that comes across in the character. Um, and so we didn't, we, yeah. So we cut out this like two minute scene, kind of showing off that was supposed to just show off all this stuff, but we really didn't need it because we got it yeah. immediately just mm -hmm. you know, just by her presence. Um, and so there's other stuff like that throughout, yeah. and then and there's a ton of dumb stuff like you don't necessarily need to see a character walking in and out of a door into a scene. Like, right, scene yeah. doesn't have to start with a person walking in and yeah. walking out. Like, you can, you can cut uh, a lot of that stuff. Um, so, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see yeah. this time on our next one how much... I, I, I mean, I can kind of see it like when we shot um, uh, Mono and mm -hmm. Danger Boy and stuff like that. Like, we... It was a lot more 
very focused on like here's the moment the information that we need yeah we don't need all this other stuff so let's yeah, just yeah. get in and get out and we just didn't have time to do it anyway but <laughs> but but, yeah. but, uh, but i think like that's going to be something going forward mm-hmm. yeah i mean there is but that being said do you kind of plan on the fact that you're going to rewrite the movie in in, in yeah. post um and so you need to give yourself a little bit of leeway don't make it so rigid that you can't change anything for sure yeah uh, because then you're going to run into problems because because yeah thank god we were able to move stuff around and move scenes around mm-hmm. in nostalgia because then we were able to strengthen the story and make the movie even better absolutely um, so that's just a thing to that you know like with most things it's it's a balance it's a balance of um of that and then just also this is something that i think we learn um on every set it's just this idea of taking advantage of what's in front of you yeah um so in my younger days as a filmmaker um i was a lot more rigid i'd storyboard everything i would know the exact blocking of actors and stuff like that and know exactly how i wanted them to say words and stuff like that um and uh believe that sounds it, like a real a-hole <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and believe it or not those movies were not fun to watch or good um and so they were they very stiff mm-hmm. yeah um and so i just really have tried to embrace this whole idea of like uh taking advantage and, and embracing what's there what's happening in front of you and so i try to let the actors be way more involved with the blocking and do what feels mm-hmm. natural to them and then i can make adjustments here and there for things that are necessary story-wise or whatever well, yeah, because there were definitely moments in nostalgia when we were trying to work out a scene. Yeah. Um, uh, especially some of the lab scenes um, where we kind of went in with more of a plan on specifically what the scene was going to be and where the actors were going to do their thing and what they were going to say and all that. And then it just, we were doing some rehearsals and I think we even shot some and we were just like, this isn't feeling right. Yeah. You know, this isn't feeling natural yeah um and so yeah jacob just went up to laura and steven and were like okay this isn't working yeah let's talk this out and figure out what we need to do to fix this scene and make it yeah a real scene yeah um and that um, that worked out great absolutely like i I think that might even been the was that the climax that that might have been yeah we did that with yeah yeah. um i mean that yeah i think there's similar times that that happened throughout the movie where we're just like Huh. What my plan isn't working. So like, yeah. let's let's take a step back mm-hmm. and see what's here. Think about what's happening in the moment. Um, so yeah, there's lots of cool. That's that's yeah, one that's of the most fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like that's one of the most. For me, that's one of the most fun parts of being on set is finding. Is is kind of that it's it's like discovering something. Um, yeah. And um, you need a plan. Go but, in with a plan, but don't hold to it so rigidly. Yeah. That you like make no, a bad movie. And go with the flow, essentially. To a certain to extent. To an extent, yeah. Yeah, like, you just need to be ready to, um, yeah, if there's something better than what you'd planned, do it. Do that, um, yeah. If it's better, yeah, like, if it, if it makes the movie better, um, don't do it just because it looks cooler or something like that. Like, it yeah. actually has to benefit the movie, but, um, but um, there's, there's surprises throughout and a lot of times it's through actors performances or it mm-hmm. could be the location or it could be um you know some weird sound like there's sounds in the movie that we were like what's this odd s- sound brian yeah. go brian go, sound go record, guy, that. Go record yeah. that sound and then they end up in the movie um, yeah so um just yeah just be ready to take advantage have a plan plan enough that you know what the important things are and what you definitely need uh and then Plan that other stuff, but be ready to just be on the lookout. There might be something better. Yeah. Good, good advice. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. kind of wrapping it up, yeah. is there anything else you want to say, address, discuss about the film that we haven't already talked about? Um, it's now available on Blu-ray and <laughs> on <laughs> electric and on Amazon Prime. You yep. can, uh, if you have Amazon Prime, you can stream it right now uh and then uh if you don't have amazon prime you can still rent it or, or buy, buy it on amazon. Um, on amazon prime um so um yeah check it out we were a lot of people worked really hard on it um very proud of the um cast and crew absolutely um they just yeah they just knocked it out of the park like a 
like I've said throughout this whole thing is we were just really really blown away we we blown away by the support before the movie was even made or in the process of being made yeah and then just at, after the movie was made and then and then at the premiere um, and since then like we've just blown been blown away by how much support um, we've had through the whole process and For sure. um, it's really what keeps us going and keeps us wanting to do it so yeah um, yeah and and one thing about making nostalgia um, that was really awesome and I hope we can somehow capture that uh, on all the films we make going forward is it really felt like a summer camp yeah when we were making it because it was just because we were a small tight-knit group of, of crew and actors and we all just genuinely enjoyed hanging out with each other and it felt like yeah we were going to work and we were making this movie and it, like a lot of times it was super stressful and super hard but we all loved doing it and we all wanted to do it together um, and it it was just like even as hard and crazy and stressful as it was sometimes like I still had fun and I still want to do that again yeah um, absolutely so yeah that was just one of the super awesome things about working on nostalgia it's just it was it was a lot of fun that's yeah that's the thing like we really try to bring on to any of our film sets and stuff like that is that, that no matter what you do no matter how much you plan ahead of time it's just going to be a stressful mm -hmm. absolutely it's like movies are stressful enough to make <laughs> there's just too many things yeah so we as the the, the, the leaders of those crews or whatever mm -hmm. um, just feel it's partly our responsibility to not let any of our stress affect the cast yeah. or the crew um, like uh, I can't even believe we didn't talk about this the cameras failed oh yeah throughout mm -hmm. the movie a few times and we had yeah. to like panic and do stuff like that I That's almost awesome. forget about it because <laughs> like because it was that type of thing like it mm -hmm. we th there's actually some actors who were there like when it was happening and like later yeah. I talked to them about that day the camera broke down and how freaked out I was and they're like wait the camera broke like they had no idea <laughs> yeah. it had happened and so um, which is it's hilarious um, yeah, it's so, funny. so yeah like it's just like there's just dumb things like that that are gonna happen it's not the actor's fault mm -hmm. that this camera is breaking down it's not mm -hmm. the sound guy's fault you know like it's nobody's fault um, and so um, just yeah like it's just really important to us that when we're like crewing up and stuff like that, that we find people that it's not just about people who can do the job. There's lots of people who can physically do these jobs. Yeah. Uh, we're really looking for people who our personalities really blend together and we all kind of um, just mesh well and just this idea of like we're all pushing each other to do better for and sure. we're all committed to making the best product we can. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, yeah, we got, we got very, very fortunate on nostalgia, um, just Absolutely. with, from everybody on that movie, from cast to crew, whatever position from top to bottom. Um, yeah. it was just a really great group of people to be around. Like, even if the, 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 the movie sucked, I hope it doesn't, I'll let you guys decide <laughs> that, but, <laughs> but, but, it, you know, it's just one of those things, like, even if none of the, the stuff that came out of it came out of it. Um, it was a fun month to make a movie. Heck yeah. Alright. Yeah. Anything else before we go? Check out your next film? Yeah, check out our check next out film. Check out the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Shifter. Um, you can follow us on uh, Facebook. We have a Facebook page. Or you can go to shifterfilm.com. Um, I think we'll probably still be in the middle of our Indiegogo uh, when this releases. Yep. Um, so please feel free to check out um, our Indiegogo for the film. Um, we've got lots of great perks. Um, we got t-shirts, we got mugs, we got, yep. uh, we got enamel pins, pins. Yeah. we got it all. So, uh, please check that out, uh, and consider a contribution. Our commitment is that every project we do is bigger and better than the last one. And so, um, we can't do it without, um, without the support of the community and then yeah. the people around us and everything like that. So please, please check it out and consider a contribution. We'd really, really appreciate it. All right. I want to thank you for checking out this segment of Films Uncovered with Uncovering Oklahoma. And I want to give a shout out to all of our supporters on Patreon. If you please check out the Show Starts Now Studios and give us some love because uh, we like to make more videos like this. So if you enjoyed this, let me know. I'm planning on doing some more in-depth interviews with 
Oklahoma filmmaker. So, all right, thank you. Bye.